the rise of the Roman Empire, a rough timeline. In 509 BC, the Roman Republic was established. Prior to the establishment of the Republic, kings had ruled Rome, also known as Ruma, from the very lane of its original Etruscan foundation. The kings dated back to the Etruscans and gradually became more Latin. The last of these kings was Tarquinius Superbus, who lived from 534 to 509 BC. He was exiled, according to legend, by the nobles. The nobles, in turn, moved to form Res Publica, also known as the Public Thing or the Commonwealth, the Republic. This completely expelled kingship. In place of kings, they set up assemblies and elected magistrates to govern Rome. The assemblies would eventually evolve to include the Comitia Centuriata, the centurial assembly consisting of 193 centuries relating to property, Comitia Tributa, the tribal assembly consisting of 35 tribes, Comitia Curiata, the ward assembly consisting only of the lictors from each ward who confirmed Empyrean of consuls and praetors, and Concilium Plebis, the plebeian assembly, plebeians only, and met by tribal unit. All citizens with voting rights were placed in a century, tribe, and ward. The magistrates eventually included two consuls, and these were executives elected by the centurial assembly, twelve praetors, who were judges elected by the Centurial Assembly, two censors elected by the Centurial Assembly, who held power to take census, make new citizens, and set dress code, and up to twelve questors, treasurers elected by the Tribal Assembly, and four aediles, who were city commissioners, two elected by the Tribal Assembly, two by the Plebeian Assembly. The ten tribunes were chosen within the plebeian assembly and held the power of veto. The senate was an advisory body consisting of ex-consuls and ex-praetors who had finished their one-year term in office. In 451 BC, the twelve tables were inscribed. Fearing that the pontiffs, who were patricians interpreting the law in terms of doubt, would interpret the law to their own private gain, the plebeian assembly had the law written down in public texts so that all could read and understand it. A commission recorded the law on twelve bronze tables and hung them in the forum for all to see and read. Included in the laws, a woman always had to remain under the guard of a man. If a man failed to pay his debt, he would be enslaved. Domestic cases, murder, criminal cases, and injury to body or property were also included in the tables. The Twelve Tables standardized the law and made it more accessible to the citizens who would attempt to live by it. In 338 BC, the Latin War ended. For three years, Rome's Latin League allies had rebelled against Roman rule, but in 338, Rome ended the war, perhaps in a show of brotherhood, aka familia paternalis, and in hope of increasing Roman influence, troops, revenue, and population, a peace settlement was made with the Latins. Rome granted the subdued Latin population partial to full citizenship. They would pay the citizen tax, serve in the military, and would receive protection, freedom of customs, no tribute, plunder from war, and the ability to vote depending on whether they were full citizens or not. Rome would often treat defeated enemies this way in the future, but full citizenship was still hard-earned, and there was certainly a difference between Savitas, a full citizen, and Savitas sine suffragatio, a partial citizen. In 218 BC, the Second Punic War began. Rome's fight with Carthage came in three steps. The First Punic War, which lasted from 264 to 241 BC, the Second Punic War, which lasted from 218 to 201 BC, and the Third Punic War, which lasted from 149 to 146 BC. Carthaginians were old Phoenicians. Latins called them Hona. In 264, the first war began when Sicily called for Roman aid against Carthage-occupied Greek cities. 
The plebeian assembly sent the army to Sicily and then engaged Carthage in war for Sicily. In 241, Carthage surrendered Sicily by a treaty with Rome, but Rome subsequently annexed Sicily, Corsica, and Sardinia, and this was seen as treacherous by Carthage, which had begun to suffer internal unrest. After long periods of Carthaginian expansion and recovery under Hamilcar and suppression of a mutiny, in 218 Hannibal, Hamilcar's son, who had been raised with revenge in mind toward Rome, went to Spain, organized a mercenary army, and invaded Roman territory, capturing Sargantum. Hannibal also won battles at Trebia, Lake Chesamine, and Caen. Yet Roman cities remained steadfast in their faithfulness to Rome. While Quintus Fabius Maximus stalled Hannibal in Italy, Publius Scipio, Africanus, invaded Carthage itself with revolutionary new weapons and tactics, forcing Hannibal to be recalled and to engage Scipio at Zama, where Hannibal was then defeated, thus ending the Second Punic War, the Hannibalic War. The victory lunged Rome into a new stage of expansion and domination of the Mediterranean, increased senatorial power, made it more elitist, introduced multiple terms of office, and increased the role of consuls, among many other benefits. Years later, in 149 BC, in accordance with the wishes of Marcus Porcius Cato, Rome re-engaged Carthage in the Third Punic War. Three years following, Carthage was completely destroyed, burned to the ground, and its inhabitants slain or enslaved. Carthage's old territories now belong to Rome. In 135 BC, a slave revolt began in Sicily. Three major times slaves revolted, and three times they were subdued. First in Sicily, from 135 to 132 BC, over 200,000 slave gang farmers revolted for three years, and were eventually subdued. The second time they revolted in Sicily, and in South Italy, from 104 to 101 BC. 30,000 slaves rebelled because their masters had ignored a law to release slaves, who had previously been free allies. The third revolt was in Italy during 73 to 71 BC. Spartacus, a former Thracian gladiator slave, rallied 100,000 men against eight Roman legions led by Crassus and Pompey. Strengthened by the ensuing victory, Crassus and Pompey would become consuls, signaling the roots of the first triumvirate. In 121 BC, Caius Gracchus died. Caius, also known as Gaius, and his brother Tiberius Gracchus were both plebeian. Their mother was a patrician, was the daughter of Publius Scipio, Africanus, who was the general that invaded Carthage during the Hannibalic War. Tiberius attempted reforms on landowning to keep the lower class farmers rich enough to afford military duty without having their property taken away by some landholder. First, Tiberius initiated these reforms from his position as a tribune, and his reforms were passed. However, Tiberius ran for a second term in office and was subsequently beaten to death by a group of senators in 133 BC. In 123, Caius became a tribune, and he set reforms on corrupt governors in the outlying provinces, and he set up a new taxing system in their place. Caius was forced to commit suicide by a group of senators after he tried to spread citizenship to other Italians. Consequently, the murder of the brothers started new political rivalry and violence, but it also empowered later revolutionaries who claimed to stand for the martyred Gracchi and the poor people for whom they died by increasing the already wide divide between the rich and poor, setting the stage for the social war. In 81 BC, Sulla organized a proscription. At the close of the Social War in 88 BC, the plebeian assembly stripped Sulla, a consul, of his command while he was still in the field, giving it to Marius, a helper of the poor. Sulla then, air quotes, cleaned house and set his supporters in all authoritative offices, only to have Marius and Cinna, the two consuls at the time, reclaim those offices outlaw Sulla, and massacre Sulla's supporters. In 82 BC, Sulla returned from the battlefield with his army, conquered Rome at the cost of many Roman lives, killed his enemies, and became dictator. 
Importantly, Sulla reduced the role of the tribunes, who were elected by the plebeian assembly and corrupted by selfish politicians in the wake of the Gracchi assassinations. Sulla became consul again in 80 and resigned a year later, having imposed his reforms. In 64 BC, Cicero became consul. Marcus Tullius Cicero lived from 106 BC to 43 BC, and he was a powerful orator who fought zealously as a lawyer and later a consul, and in almost every area of Roman government, to preserve the Republic. But Rome was outgrowing its former governmental structure, and in 43 BC, after Cicero accused Marcus Antonius as being corrupt, Cicero was assassinated. In 70 BC, prior to his assassination, Cicero prosecuted a man by the name of Gaius Verres on charges of looting, killing, and torturing citizens in Sicily to satiate his lust for wealth and Greek art. Cicero delivered an inspiring speech condemning Verres, and Verres was convicted. This prosecution was Cicero's first notable act in oration, yet ironically less than a year before Cicero was assassinated, for condemning Mark Antony, Verres himself was murdered at the order of Antony in 43 BC. Cicero also defamed his political opposite Lucius Sergius Catalina before the Senate in 63 as BC. Throughout his political career, Cicero gave speeches that helped endue Roman culture with Stoicism, which was a submission to a divine plan, cosmic order, and authority. He also gave speeches to help encourage political morality and the pursuit of higher education. He argued and died to keep the Republic alive, but just as Cicero died in 43 BC, the Republic was already nearing its own long overdue death. In 63 BC, Catiline formed a conspiracy. Lucius Sergius Catalina was a patrician who had been falsely disgraced by the Senate for lewd behavior and debauchery in 71 BC. In 64 BC, he tried to become consul again to assassinate Cicero, the presiding consul at the time, and other senators, and undermine the Republic. He probably planned the conspiracy in revenge for the dishonorable end to his career, but he wasn't the only person involved in the conspiracy, and Catiline would have had other intentions for the conspiracy, had it played out. Four others were executed for aiding the conspiracy, and subsequently Catiline himself died fighting against the Republic. In 60 BC, the first triumvirate was formed. The first triumvirate included Gnaeus Pompeius, also known as Pompey, a famous Roman general, Marcus Licinius Crassus, the wealthiest man in Rome at the time, and Gaius Julius Caesar, an ambitious patrician from an old but poor family. Pompey formed this alliance in order to build support for him, awarding land and power to his troops in the Near East. In 59 BC, Caesar became consul and caused the Senate to support Pompey's Near East plan. Caesar also paid the debts of the client tax collectors of Crassus using public funds. In return, Caesar was allowed the governorship, the proconsulship, in Po Valley and Illyricum, and military power to defend the transalpine Gaul from German invaders. Caesar's fate will be discussed later along with Pompey's. Crassus and his legions died while attempting to overthrow the Persian Empire in Parthia in 53 BC, just as Caesar was campaigning in Europe. In 59 BC, Caesar became proconsul in Gaul. Caesar had been given a proconsulship in the province of Gaul and the Po River Valley, and he also had military command. The province was under threat by German encroachers, so Caesar subsequently pushed back against the Gallic Celts, beginning the Gallic War. From 58 to 50 BC, Caesar dominated much of southwestern Europe, annexing France, Belgium, and Rhineland and occupying portions of Britain, recording everything in his own personal commentaries on the war. Meanwhile, Crassus died in Syria. Pompey governed Spain from Rome, and the Senate became weary of Caesar's fame and leadership in Europe, Gaul, and throughout Rome. The Senate enlisted Pompey and his legions against Caesar, 
and they commanded Caesar to return from Europe at once, and to surrender his command in Gaul. In response, in 49 BC, Caesar invaded Roman territory with his army. Caesar's invasion lasted until around 45 BC, and by that time he had achieved complete public support. In 48 BC, having retreated to Greece, Pompey was defeated by Caesar in a bloody battle at Pharsalus. Pompey would eventually be assassinated by Egyptian politicians loyal to Caesar. In 45 BC, Caesar became dictator for life. Having won the hearts and minds of Roman citizens through reforms to, to reconstruct and unify Italy, Caesar justifiably became dictator for life in 45 BC after finishing off the last of Pompey's forces. Caesar centralized the authority of Rome, put a severe limit or check on the Senate, and increased the Senate to 900 members, colonized North Africa and Gaul, brought in new citizens, resettled many landless citizens, simplified the calendar to 365.25 days, standardized coins in administration, and began work on the library. He held out great beneficence toward the people of Rome, including his own enemies. Nevertheless, many envied Caesar's power. So Marcus Junius Brutus led some senators to assassinate Caesar while the Senate was in session, triggering renewed instability as Brutus would be moral but an ineffective leader. In 43 BC, the Second Triumvirate was formed. The Second Triumvirate included Marcus Antonius, also known as Mark Anthony, aide to Caesar, who first opposed Brutus and the conspirators who helped in his assassination, Gaius Julius Caesar Octavianus, also known as Octavian, who was 19 at the time, grandnephew to Caesar, and Marcus Lepidus, commander of Caesar's cavalry. They joined together to rule Rome without benefit of the consuls or the senate, and realistically, the republic no longer existed under their rule. In 43-42 to 42 BC, at the Battle of Philippi, the triumvirate proscribed Brutus and the other conspirators, killing every last one. Afterward, Lepidus was stripped of his power. Octavian took western Roman territory, including Italy, and Antony took the east, ruling with Cleopatra in the pleasures of Egypt. Octavian came to be seen as the guardian of Italian tradition and culture, but Antony was seen by many Romans who were living in Italy as having given in to debauchery. Indeed, Mark Antony did little to appease this view of him in Rome, but Octavian began to fill the shoes of the murdered Caesar. In 31 BC, the Battle of Actium took place. The contrast between Octavian Caesar and Mark Antony led to war in 31 BC. At the Battle of Actium, Octavian defeated Antony and Cleopatra on both land and sea. Antony and Cleopatra stole away to Egypt, soon to be a Roman-occupied territory, and they committed suicide the following year at Alexandria. When this battle ended, so too ended both the Roman Republic and the Hellenistic Age, for in 27 BC the Senate named Octavian Augustus also known as the Revered, or Caesar for short, the preserver of the forms of the Republic. This title is not to be held lightly, but as Augustus, Octavian would create a cleverly disguised dictatorship. In 14 AD, Caesar Augustus died. Augustus took up the relations, ideals, reforms, and projects that Caesar had begun years earlier, easing his rise to power. He centralized his imperial legislative and religious power. He developed a government that used the forms of a republic, but was ultimately a dictatorship run by himself. He controlled the legions, finances, and tax collection, continued Romanization, set standards of morality, considerably weakened the senators while giving them more honors to keep them fat and happy, placed garrisons of legionaries in cities to defend the border, and created a highly efficient and centralized imperial administrative web. He referred to himself as princeps, or citizen leader, but indeed he was a dictator who brought about the principate, the transition from the Republic to the Roman Empire, and Pax Romana, Roman peace. 
Augustus was willing to openly suppress or assassinate any rivals or dissenters. He passed his power on to his son Tiberius. Upon his death in 14 AD, and this heritage would have continued but Nero committed suicide in 68 AD without leaving an heir, so others would continue the empire in a less discreet manner.